Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope you can uh, hear me there and see me. Um, I'm going to just uh, change my video settings here for one second. Um, okay, so uh, welcome back. I hope you all had a chance to, to get uh, a little bit of a move around wherever you're based uh, and a cup of tea or coffee or whatever whatever the case may be. Um, so the, in this section, it's, a, it's kind of a standalone section, so it it's kind of bridges us between the research that we've heard this morning, which, which has been amazing um, and really, really worthwhile uh, listening back to that. If you get an opportunity once the recording is available, and I know I would be doing so myself. Um, so it kind of bridges us between that and, uh, and the, the afternoon sessions. Uh, so I want to uh, present this new piece of research uh, called the Barriers or Pathways, and it's uh, part of the funding behind this event, as I said earlier on, was also to conduct a study of adults' current experiences of disclosure to child protection services. Um, so as most of you will be aware, if, if not from beforehand, definitely from this morning's presentations, uh, retrospective disclosures are disclosures by adults of abuse uh, they've experienced during their childhood. Um, and I suppose they've been recognised in, in child protection policy uh, in, in Ireland for over the last two decades, first recognised in, in Children First National Guidelines in 1999. Um, and at that point, they were quite strongly phrased in policy uh, and quite, uh, quite well acknowledged in terms of they were described as in, in terms of the investigation of disclosures by adult victims of past abuse frequently uncovers current instances of abuse and is therefore an effective means of stopping the cycle of abuse. So we can see from the original recognition of retrospective disclosures in child protection policy, the quality uh, that, that Marilene spoke about there of this courage of coming forward was acknowledged in policy. Now, I would argue that's that slipped away somewhat in terms of, of where we're at at the moment, um, to the point where some of the adults I've interviewed have expressed these concerns, which are, are kind of, um, you know, ensuring that this system that they are approaching at all levels uh, realizes what, what, what sexual abuse is and, and how it can impact somebody. Uh, so we have this quote here from Alan suggesting that some people don't even realize what way sexual abuse affects them. Like, you know, the way they are, their personality. So I just think there should be this basic consideration to at least try and imagine how they are, that person is feeling at that meeting coming to meet you. Are they nervous? Are they anxious? We'll make them feel safe and secure and we'll respect it. And that's that's what they wanted uh, 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 this research to understand, that they wanted this respect, this feeling of safety, this feeling of security. So the context of the current study that I'm going to launch today is my previous work in gathering adults experiences of disclosure, particularly to the child protection system. And I think uh, this quote adequately sums up the basic requirements upon all of us to stop and consider what might be acting as barriers and what might help. Um, the study itself, uh, I initially wanted, to, this is the previous study as some context, I initially wanted to explore adults, individuals, uh, uh, their experiences of going through the process of disclosing and engaging with the child protection ser service um, and what that was like having experienced something like child sexual abuse. So the study had three main aims, to look at what the facilitators and barriers were, uh, to look at how the system currently takes account of the specific needs of adults who have been uh, sexually abused as children. Uh, and those are not homogenous uh, uh, needs. They're not generic. They are specific to the individuals themselves, albeit we have from international research some commonalities, some key trend, uh, trends and themes that, that do show up in terms of people who experience um, child sexual abuse. And finally, what are the adults telling us and what are their uh, experiences uh, in terms of how can they feed into new policy developments or better practice in this area? So I wanted to know what the facilitators and barriers are for adults coming forward. And what featured strongly was the fact that the system itself featured as a barrier for people coming forward at many levels. Echoing issues that have been raised previously by reports by HICWA, by the Office of the Ombudsman, um, adults highlighted poor communication when they engaged with child protection services. They, they highlighted a lack of clarity about understanding what the process of assessment would be once they handed over their disclosure. And they highlighted, unfortunately, long delays with one participant uh, that of my study giving up on the process due to not having heard anything back 
things are changing and practice is developing in pockets and it's important to, to, to state that. Um, but I suppose it's important to state the adults' experiences as well. Uh, many of the adults uh, uh, praised social workers for their work in general, but they had this sense that this work, uh, retrospective disclosures, was not the mainstay of their role. And they experienced this as a kind of a lack of expertise in the area. And as a social worker, I suppose, and somebody who's come through a social work education system and is now a social work educator, uh, we do have a generic social work education. We have various degrees and levels of, of, of quality of education around sexual abuse, um, but we don't have a standardized uh, a curriculum across the, the country, and we don't have specialization as such until post-qualification. And that's patchy uh, and dependent on the professional themselves and access to funding and resources, for example. So we're, we're working from a generic base, albeit a skilled base in the profession itself. Um, so the legal context in respect of retrospective disclosures um, also cannot be ignored, and we've, we've paid attention to a little bit of this this morning as well. And I've also done some work on the legal context in particular, published in 2018, and this has been drawn upon in the Departmental uh, Expert Assurance Group process, and also in the HICWA assessment itself uh, used that work. So I don't propose to go into it today, but the adults who were interviewed as part of my original research they were conscious of this context of legal complexity and difficulties that social workers were facing in this area. <clears throat> this was prior to mandatory reporting. So even at that, <clears throat> excuse me, even at that point, there were legal complexities that were playing into these barriers to disclosure. So while the wider policy and legal system acted as a barrier, there were also some interpersonal issues uh, raised by the adults. And these included the physical inter and interpersonal environment in which disclosures were received but also the language used in policy and practice uh, featuring as barriers and impacting and triggering uh, the dynamics of, of abuse. And those dynamics, as we know, are replicated quite often in disclosure. <clears throat> so I wanted to know if current practices are taking account uh, or were taking account at that time uh, of the needs of those adults coming forward. And in this concept, uh, uh, or in this context, the concept of power featured strongly. And this isn't uncommon when we're examining issues of, uh, of sexual abuse and particularly child sexual abuse. The dynamic of power is, a, is a, an ever-present um, uh, aspect of, of both the abuse itself, but also that uh, continuing journey, as, as David Finkelhor calls it, of, <clears throat> of disclosure. And we have some scholars excellent in this field, two of which will be present today, Ramona Alagia and Rosaline McIlvany, who talk about this you know, um, testing the boundaries, telling and not telling, um, uh, sort of pressures for secrecy and containment and different forms of disclosure over the life course from behavioral manifestations to denials um, to active telling. Uh, so, so we need to be considerate of power in all of these uh, uh, experiences. And one of the interviewees, Alan here, you may have read it already, he it urges us to consider that we need to consider people um, coming forward, the people that you're going to meet are probably all that week leading up to it, thinking about it, going through it, reliving what has happened to them, you know, going back to a place that maybe they don't necessarily want to be, want to visit. And all of these things need to be taken into account. And I suppose this is, is in a general sense, this is what we now call trauma informed care, it's our trauma informed approaches. It's considering trauma in the life of another and acting appropriately, essentially. How would you change what you're doing, knowing that there is trauma present? Uh, and uh, Alan sums this up really succinctly in terms of his interaction with social work and what he had expected. So the adults felt there was a lack of understanding of the dynamics of sexual abuse. And as I said, also critically, the dynamics of disclosure, um, how these interact with each other and how they might affect somebody who's coming forward. Many shared concerns relating to the handing over of their story and a loss of control in the context of delay and uncertainty. And I'll speak about that in a moment in context of these new findings. Um, adults use similar language, uh, coincidentally, when they describe this period of having disclosed social workers. And they talked about it as entering a void, entering a black hole or falling off a cliff. One adult used this really, really apt analogy of a grenade saying, it's like pulling a pin pin on a grenade and then you wait. So potentially interacting with dynamics or impacts of, of abuse, such as hypervigilance, anxiety, fear, apprehension, issues that we know can be associated with, with traumatic experiences in childhood. And for somebody impacted by sexual abuse, as Patrick says, one of the interviewees, 
potentially that void is going to be filled with something. The usual imagination of somebody who has been sexually abused isn't necessarily the straightforward imagination. It's probably going to be more paranoid, more shame, more guilt. They must know this. Some of them must have read a book on this somewhere. They must get it even vaguely, intellectually, if not from lived experience or not from having worked closely with people to go, this is important. So ultimately, while the adults' experiences were unfortunately predominantly negative, uh, they did share sentiments in terms of what they expected would happen or what they wished would happen. And I thought it was useful to look at these in terms of how we can facilitate. Um, both Rosaline and Ramona and other scholars in the area of disclosure have cited the fact that we have this tendency to focus on the barriers to disclosure, which are critically important. Uh, we need to map those, chart those, know where they, they come into play and how they impact people. But we need to move forward and look at how we facilitate. Um, and I suppose this is some of the area that I'm, I'm kind of moving into at the moment. Um, and the, the, the results of that original uh, <clears throat> piece of research can roughly be translated into these three areas uh, of recommendations. The first is the law, and this is widely recognized in the sector uh, across stakeholders between TUSLA and the department themselves, um, commentators such as the Rapporteur on Child Protection, Professor Conor Romani, my own work, we need legislation. Um, we need legislation to underpin social workers' assessment and responses in this area. Section three of the Child Care Act 1991, which underpins this section by its very year predates the original uh, recognition of, of adult disclosures in 1999. So it was never developed with these types of assessments, this type of interaction in mind. Um, one area that I'm looking at at the moment, and I'll speak a little bit about it in terms of the new research, is the EU Victims Directive. It's a directive, uh, which I'll say a little bit more about later. It's predominantly within the context of criminal justice systems, but I think there's a lot there in terms of uh, paving a way, a victim-centric way, in order to facilitate and support people to come forward. In terms of policy, we need a clear published social work policy based on law that is, is, is apt and fit for purpose and based on research. And that research and, uh, and those policies fundamentally being based on the voices and experiences of people who, are, who have come through the system or who are coming through the system. What are their needs and, and how do we best meet those? Um, this notion of developing safe and trusted spaces, uh, and we have a pilot Barna House model uh, here in Ireland at the moment, over in the West and looking at two other sites, I think potentially Dublin and, and, and Cork, um, and hopefully they'll be rolled out. Um, we, we may need to look at some sort of a system uh, uh, for adults, uh, whereby we have a barn house for adults. And a barn house, for those who, who aren't aware, is, is, a, is a center, essentially a physical center, but it need not, need not necessarily be that, of all of the services that are required, medical, legal, psychological, therapeutic, social work, that wrap around the individual, requiring one disclosure, one engagement, and then coming to meet that person's needs where they are at as opposed to the person going to the individual services. Um, I think Ramona might mention this later, but there is a service in Canada for adults around uh, uh, sexual abuse, which is structured on this Barna House Child Advocacy Centre model. And she may say a little bit about this, uh, but it would be really interesting to hear that. In terms of practice then, as I said, we're, we're fundamentally talking about trauma-informed care. Um, Jerry Chu, a social work scholar, he talks about needing to understand the person and how they have come to experience powerlessness. And David Ho, another social work scholar, given my own background, poses this ethos of needing to accept me, talk to me and understand me. And if we work from that basis in collaboration with people coming forward to disclose, I think we're in good stead and we possibly see a lot of different practice and a different structure of policy in this area. So this research was conducted in 2015, um, and I want to watch my own time on this because our speakers this morning were absolutely on the button in terms of time. Um, so this research was conducted, as I say, in, in um, 2015. It was published earlier this year in Child Abuse Review, so I will make that available uh, in the resources at a later uh, stage, as I said, possibly next week. Um, but the question remains, where are we today? So that brings us to this study that I'm launching today. Uh, and I'm delighted that the, the Irish Examiner has covered it this morning as well uh, with a piece on it. So thanks to them for that. Um, since the last study, a lot has changed, as many of you in the area will know. Uh, we have mandatory reporting now active since 2017. 
We have GDPR uh, recognized under the Data Protection Act 2018, which incorporates the, the general data protection regulation uh, from the EU into national law. And we also have developments uh, in terms of uh, assessment of allegations of abuse within our social work services, uh, the development of the child abuse substantiation procedures, and the continued use of, I suppose, the policy for responding to child abuse and neglect, um, uh, which is the existing policy. So the study sought to explore to what extent adults are experiencing different types of supports that are already included in the EU Victims Directive. So as I say, the EU Victims Directive doesn't apply to social, uh, social work services and child protection services, but I wanted to suss out if we're, if we're doing any of this already and, 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 and what, how can we build on that? So I wanted to phrase, uh, use the language of the EU Victims Directive, but not directly uh, point to it and ask adults, are you experiencing this? Are you experiencing this when you engage? And then see if that quality is there. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a moment. I wanted to explore if adults' experiences of data protection, uh, what those were in terms of engaging with child protection services. And I want to explore what factors currently may be acting as facilitators and barriers to disclosure of childhood sexual abuse to child protection services. So the study itself was designed and the data collection phase was greatly supported by three partners, the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre, One in Four and Rape Crisis Network Ireland. And I'm really thankful to uh, the collaborators on that. We met a couple of times before lockdown hit us all and uh, it was really useful to have them on board, revising the questions, looking at the, the survey instrument and, and fundamentally uh, uh, getting access uh, to collect the data. The study itself, as I said, was also funded by UCD Seed Funding and an Irish Research Council New Foundations grant. So thank you to those also. It was an online survey uh, run between May and December 2020, and uh, we had a total of 29 respondents. Not a huge response, but uh, I suppose like everyone else, we were impacted by COVID at the time. So the data collection period was even extended from August to December. And we also went back to seek um, uh, ethical approval or et an, an amendment to ethical approval to allow us to, to recruit publicly, as there weren't too many people entering um, um, therapeutic services, physical services at that time. So the survey covered four main areas and it employed um, a skip logic approach, which I'll explain in a moment, uh, which means I suppose that participants were only presented with those sets of questions that were applicable to their experiences. So if they responded to one set that related to another area, for example, if somebody identified they had received contact from child protection services, they, they were directed then to the questions that dealt with their engagement with child protection services. Somebody said they didn't receive contact, then they, they moved to a, a latter stage. So this meant that the survey um, received a total of 29 responses, but that some sections received less responses due to the use of this skip logic. The rationale was to, to reduce the risk of overburdening participants and to ensure the participants uh, were only responding to the questions that were relevant to them. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll highlight how many respondents to each section when, I, when I'm reporting the results. So it's a small sample, as I say, but I think it's an instructive sample and it speaks to the wider research as well. So I think it's relevant in that sense. So in terms of general experiences of disclosure, um, in terms of demographics, uh, all were aged between 25 and 64, with 45% of the participants between the ages of 45 and 54. The sample was 86% female, uh, which is not uncommon when looking at issues of, of sexual abuse uh, in terms of research. Uh, and there was an equal national spread, uh, albeit excluding Ulster. We didn't purposefully exclude Ulster, but we didn't have any participants from Ulster. Uh, and Dublin and the rest of Leinster were separated. So across them all, there was a, there was a fairly even spread uh, nationally of responses. Uh, and we can see here the age at first disclosure was predominantly uh, when people were in adulthood from 18 years here at one participant up to 45 years plus. So we can see that trend of delay of disclosure uh, for whatever reason uh, and the predominant uh, um, um, occurrence of disclosure in adulthood, if at all. Uh, this was further evident in our uh, latency to disclosure, which is a, a, a something that Ramona Alagia talks about in her original work, and that is that time between the original abuse uh, and that first disclosure. So we can see that 74% disclosed for the first time more than 10 years after the abuse had occurred, again highlighting that delay. What's causing that delay? We looked at all of these systems this morning, and many of them are contributing to this in many ways, societally, 
community level, familial level, personal issues um, that are impacting the person, like shame and stigma uh, and, and guilt, uh, or maybe a sense of not being believed. So the first recipient to disclosure varied from participant uh, with family and friends accounting for the majority of first recipients. Uh, interestingly, when we look at disclosure over the life course in this survey, 6% responded that they had disclosed at some point via social media. And I'd argue that maybe that that's kind of a, a fairly underrepresented uh, in terms of the wider context in Ireland. And again, we're highlighting our keynote later on, Ramona has done some work on this in terms of the Me Too movement in, in Canada, uh, looking at disclosure via social media. And I think it would, it would warrant some attention here in Ireland as well to see how that's working, uh, what are people's experiences of that, and how, how are we supporting and facilitating via social media? Uh, in saying that, both of our, our guests at, uh, after lunch as well, Hazel and Mick, are, are prominent advocates on social media, uh, and they may actually have some comments on, on that part of their work as well, so, so we might uh, tap into that in a moment. Um, so just before we, we kind of, I, I'm conscious of my time, I want to bring us into some of the results here. Uh, in terms of understanding the process, uh, participants were asked about the period uh, between their disclosure to a professional and receiving initial contact from child protection services. So it, we must note here at this point that there may be a huge variety of reasons um, uh, for the variation in time period between a, an adult's disclosing and, and the child protection services becoming involved. Um, but we can see that the majority of participants were contacted within six months. Um, no participants chose the option stating that they were contacted within one week or, or within one month, uh, and with one participant indicating that they were uh, still awaiting contact at the time of the survey. So to put this in context, this is when somebody has disclosed to a professional, like a, a counsellor or a psychotherapist, that counsellor or psychotherapist has made a report, and then it's the time between that contact and the report back or the contact back from Child Protection Services. So predominantly around a six month period. Um, and I think that practice is changing and, and, and it'd be great to hear in the Q&A from some of our colleagues in social work on that. Uh, two participants unfortunately did provide information in the other function on the survey to highlight that they had received delays of between three and five years respectively. So um, hopefully outliers, and I, uh, I would suggest that they are outliers, but individual experiences nonetheless. And they were they, the similar experiences were flagged in my original research. Uh, with, with significant delays such as that. In terms of um, uh, understanding the process, 54% uh, uh, said that they were not provided with any written material regarding the process that child protection services would follow after their engagement. Those that did receive written material, it tended to be in the form of letter, uh, and uh, Marilyn uh, really uh, emphasised the significance of receiving that letter. And how that can be worded, how it's shaped, the language used is hugely significant. Um, so whatever the material or explanation provided for the process, a majority of those who responded to this uh, section of the survey either disagreed or strongly agreed with the statement that they understood the process of what would happen regarding their assessment of their disclosure. So the majority here not clear as to what happens when they hand over their story echoing that void maybe, that black hole that we, we spoke about earlier on. In terms of the initial engagement with Child Protection Services, there were some examples of positive practice and it's really good to highlight these here. 58% received a written acknowledgement of their disclosure um, uh, at some point, and a similar percentage were provided with a contact detail for a specific person uh, that they could contact within the Child Protection Service in relation to their disclosure. That's key and that's actually a piece under the EU Victims Directive uh, for criminal justice systems have that contact person available excuse me so even even this written acknowledgement i suppose as i said can be a huge piece for someone who has come forward it's acknowledgement of their disclosure in print uh, on official headed paper and it's moving something that maybe have been hidden for quite a number of years into something tangible that a person is maybe sitting in their kitchen in their in the morning with their cup of coffee holding in their hands and for the first time it might be the first tangible uh, example of, of, of their abuse that they have experienced. Uh, so, so we need to just bear these things in mind, I think, as, as Alan said in the quote, we just need to, to know this is important. 
Half of the respondents in this section uh, were also offered an opportunity not to proceed with the process of assessment, which is interesting in the context of mandatory reporting. Uh, and I think, you know, social workers are really struggling with this. They uh, operate from a trauma informed perspective. Uh, they, and I mean, we as in the profession are trained to be person centered uh, and compassionate and relationship based. So my original research going back to 2012 with social work practitioners, they call this an ill fit with social work practice, and I think it's still an ill fit. Um, so I think we need we need to we need to develop quickly on this. Um, however, there were variable experiences of being kept up to date uh, in respect of the assessment of the disclosure, and we can see that um, a majority felt that they were not kept up to date. One argument that the report is proposing uh, today, and the report is available online already. I'll put it in the chat after this. Uh, and it will be available with the resources later on as well, is that the EU Victims Directive may provide some solutions uh, to the issues raised by the adults coming forward. Just to put us all on the same page, I suppose this was enacted in 2012. Uh, it's a directive that allows for individual member states to determine how best to integrate provisions of the directive into national law. And it covers uh, this sort of general ethos uh, of member states shall ensure that victims are recognised and treated in a respectful, sensitive, tailored, professional and non-discriminatory manner, manner, and that all contacts with victim support or, or restorative justice and or a competent authority uh, operating within the context of criminal proceedings. Now, as it says, criminal proceedings, I'm arguing, and, and Conor Romani has taken this argument in his um, in his recent report also, that maybe this could be adopted into child protection or ancillary processes that adults or children are engaging with. Um, and, and we'll have a look at that now. And, and, and it's relevant because under the directive, a victim is, is a natural person who has suffered harm as a result of a criminal offence. Child sexual abuse is simultaneously both a child protection issue and a criminal offence. Um, it's of particular relevance in the context as it specifically recognises victims of sexual uh, crimes and violence within the, the context of close relationships. So it's pertinent for what we're talking about. And it recognises the victim uh, whether or not uh, a perpetrator is identified, apprehended or prosecuted. Uh, it acknowledges the likelihood of delayed disclosure and therefore potentially redresses the conflating of, uh, as we see in the, in the system somewhat, this conflating of past harm or past risk going back to Jennifer's uh, presentation, it con confining it to, to, the, to, the, to the realms of history, so to speak. We're talking about very real trauma and potentially talking about very real, real risk as well. So we need, to, we, need to, we need to get over that kind of um, past harm, past risk uh, aspect. It has some specific issues uh, that it addresses. So a right to understand and be understood, a right to receive information from first contact, uh, I'm arguing that uh, the child protection services would, would constitute a competent authority. And Maria MacDonald, the barrister, has written a report on the EU Victims Directive back a um, couple of years back now when it came into law first here in Ireland. And she's also specifically highlighted child protection services as an ancillary or competent authority within the, the remit. Uh, so it should be extended. As I said, then the, the state itself decides where to implement the EU Victims Directive in national law. So it's up to us as a state, open to us as a state, to implement this and integrate it into uh, child protection law. And with the current review of the Child Care Act being, uh, being uh, run by the uh, department, I think now is an opportune time to integrate some of these issues. Uh, a right to information about your case, a right to access to victim services, a minimum standard of such services, and protection against repeat victimization. And that specifically addresses this piece around maybe the sharing of information, and possible reprisal from an alleged perpetrator, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. So I asked these questions about the, the EU Victims Directive and using the language of the directive, I asked the following. I asked if, if, if people had received any of the following information without on due delay. Uh, did you receive the type of support that you could obtain and from whom? Uh, did you receive the processes for making a complaint? how and under what conditions one could obtain protection, how and under what conditions you could access legal advice, legal aid, and any other sort of advice, and specific details uh, of services related to sexual abuse, counselling, therapy, therapy, advocacy, or support. So of the 12 that responded to this um, uh, section, um, sorry, three, three, uh, three of the respondents to this section were offered the information regarding how to make a complaint. 
And of note, unfortunately, only one person was provided with specific details regarding support services related to sexual abuse. Uh, a majority of respondents answered that they had received none of this. So 67% uh, uh, of the respondents uh, stated that they received none of this advice. So it should be noted that 2% um, or 42%, sorry, of the respondents to this section at the time of the survey still had ongoing interactions with child protection services. So this information may have been coming to them uh, and, and they may have received it after the survey and we have to be open to that. In terms of the language of the directive, uh, receiving uh, that engagement as respectful, we can see varies um, across the board and there are variable experiences. Um, 15 of the respondents engaged in this section of the survey and were asked to what degree their experience was respectful, sensitive, professional, non-discriminatory, and appropriate to meet their needs, if, if any needs uh, arose. So we can see this is quite mixed, uh, and there may be some positives here in the fact that we, we do see people neither agreeing or, or disagreeing, uh, but also agreeing uh, with the fact that they, they, they received a respectful service. But also, you know, we have over 50% of people on the disagree and strongly disagree uh, uh, to, to receiving the service as respectful. Very similar in terms of sensitivity, receiving the service as sensitive. Um, better on professional, and that's, that stands to the, to the interpersonal reaction or interaction with, it, with an individual social work service, um, I would argue, and that person-centeredness being evident in the practice. Uh, so we get a, a, a majority of people experiencing the service as professional. And also speaking to the values of social work, uh, they receive the service predominantly as non-discriminatory. So I think that needs to be highlighted also. Unfortunately, in terms of meeting the needs, and this, this echoes the, the previous results uh, suggesting that the dynamics of abuse and disclosure are maybe not understood completely, um, that they didn't feel that it was appropriate to meet their needs. So I wanna try and wrap up relatively quickly. I'm gone slightly over time, but I will cut my own question time if that's okay, because um, I want to move into this section. And this is, this is kind of uh, stands away from the previous research in terms of how was information sharing uh, experienced. And in the context of recent developments in data protection, uh, the enactment of the Data Protection Act and the recognition of uh, GDPR in Irish law, the survey wanted to examine uh, what it, these experiences of information sharing were. And uh, as a standalone section, this had probably the strongest response barring the introductory pieces. Uh, so we had 22 responses here. Follow engagements with child protection services, most participants were not informed that their personal information would be shared with a third party. Um, so in terms of the dynamics of trust um, and belief and uh, reprisal potentially, uh, abuse predominantly occur occurring within close-knit social circles, um, that heightened sense of what was going to happen next and who knows about this was evident in my previous research within uh, one of the participants saying you're pulling into a, a family event in your car, you're parking on the road, you're looking out for the car of the perpetrator who's a family member, not knowing what you're walking into. So this is echoed here in the fact that people weren't advised, uh, according to the participants of this survey uh, uh, anyway, were not advised that, that their information would be shared with the third party. Um, most were not told of this, that the specifics of their disclosure would be shared um, with a third party or with any other person. Um, and that's, that's not just their general information, but this is the specific details of their allegation or their disclosure, their experiences of abuse. So again, this personal narrative being translated potentially into a, a, a public risk and the adults then being secondary to that entire process. And then was your information shared? That ultimate question. And at the time of the study, most were unsure if their information had been shared. Uh, and I suppose we need to reflect on this in terms of the dynamics of abuse and how we're caring for people in a trauma-informed way and protecting their, their, their rights as well as the, those of, of uh, other parties involved in the process. So on reflection, uh, 12 of the respondents here chose to complete this section on relating to their overall experiences of engaging with child protection services. And unfortunately, when asked if starting over, would they engage in this process again? Uh, most say, stated that they would not, uh, posing the question uh, for how we develop services and responses in this area of practice. So just finally, um, I want to know, I suppose, has the system changed since Tony's piece here in 2015 when he was interviewed? You finally get the courage up to tell somebody about it, somebody who you think is going to do something and you become a victim again. You become a victim of the system 
And that's not changing, and that's never going to change in this country. And I sincerely hope Tony is wrong about that, and I sincerely hope that we can add a little bit of a chink today with the, the expertise that are available here. So I just want to thank you for your time on that. I'm gone slightly over, but hopefully there's some questions uh, that I can answer uh, before we take our, our short lunch break. Okay, so I have a question here um, from uh, Darren uh, Broomfield. Uh, thanks, Darren. Um, I hope you can all hear me and see me still. Uh, uh, so it, it's, a, it's, it's a question around the scope for improved responses to disclosures within a possibly amended Criminal Justice Victims of Crime Act 2017 for victims, given that it was transposed from EU uh, directive. Um, so, so what Darren is, is referring to there is that we have, a, uh, we have implemented the EU Victims Directive into Irish law and we've done that via the Criminal Justice Victims of Crime Act, uh, but it does confine the, the remit of the, of the directive into criminal justice proceedings. And therefore, there's no obligation, I suppose, on, on other ancillary services, as I call them, such as statutory child protection services, to adopt the same approach. Um, now, what I would argue, uh, Darren, in response to that is that I think there is scope for us to adopt those provisions or at least use parts of the EU Victims Directive as a template for charting a new, um, a new Child Care Act and new, uh, I suppose, statutory uh, underpinning and support for social workers carrying out this role. If, of course, social work uh, and child protection services are the, the, the area that should be dealing with retrospective disclosures, uh, at all, and there's debate around that, and people will have various opinions on it. So I think there is scope for it, Darren, and I, I, I and others, uh, and I see some on the call here, I know um, colleagues from Tusla even, uh, that I've worked with um, putting um, uh, recommendations in to the department as part of that review process to encompass and incorporate some of these provisions. So I would, I would like to see that area develop um, as we go forward. Um, I have another one uh, here from um, uh, Valerie uh, Carson, and you mentioned reasons for delay in disclosures. Do you have research on what triggered encouraged disclosures and when they do happen? So I don't specifically have research on that, uh, Valerie, in terms of my own research, but in my experience of the research and looking at the international research, it is as individual as individuals themselves. Um, I interviewed one individual who, uh, uh, was abused significantly as a child and 40 years later saw a, a surname on the TV that was similar to the person who had abused them and it all came flooding back and, and, and it was a realisation then of what had happened uh, and, and a realisation that that person needs to act uh, and, and tell somebody about this. So it can happen in many different ways and those dynamics are as individual as the individuals themselves. Um, Joe, um I'm just coming in here just because you're trying to answer and look through the questions. So there's one there from, from Kleena, uh, Kleena Sadler from the Rape Crisis Network of Ireland. And she's just wondering, were any of the participants non-consenting to the reporting when you were interviewing? That's interesting, actually. I didn't, uh, we didn't capture that, Kleena. Um, so that will be something for, for, future, for future research. Um, and I think that's anecdotally, at least, and Tina will have a better idea than myself, but from work with one and four and others, um, that tends to be uh, a predominant issue. And I'm not too sure how that's been managed um, in terms of uh, the, 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 the policy design, because remember, the policy design is being, is being underpinned by a, a piece of legislation that wasn't written with these assessments in mind, but also in, in the context of mandatory reporting, which um potentially uh, and and obviously at this stage didn't take this particular dynamic into into mind either um so we are pushing adults uh, towards the child protection system um and in terms of their resistance to to sort of go forward with that i think that needs to be recognized and i think that needs to be legitimized uh, in terms of any new policy or, or framework that's going to be there so it needs to be gather, gathered um and interestingly i suppose as a kind of corollary to that, uh, Kleena, I think future research also needs to examine uh, 
the experiences of social workers in terms of how they're receiving it and, and what their ethos is uh, and, and how they're feeling about having to manage these types of very complex, almost quasi-legal, quasi-forensic types of assessments. Um, and it's not, as that original research suggested, it, it, it's an ill fit somewhat with the, with the ethos and values of, of social work. And, and Joe, um, uh, thanks again. There's been a number of comments and questions, I suppose, about, again, leaning just on what you said there uh, in relation to training for social workers, um, uh, the, the development of dedicated teams that work in this area within um, particular agencies such as TUSLA. Um, and I suppose and some uh, practitioners uh, talking there about maybe not feeling from experience that much has changed. So yeah. just in relation to that, Joe, I was, I was just kind of thinking in relation to the that question around training and if you had a magic wand, um, what kind of training um, or uh, professional development do you think, not just social workers, but mm -hmm. other, um, other professionals? Because I'm really conscious that Disclosures can come to counsellors, as Marilyn spoke about, but also to, to general, general practitioners, family doctors, consultants, uh, public health nurses, obstetricians. Um, and like what if you had a if you had a magic wand and could could create a training program that would help and make make professionals feel competent and confident, what would that look like? Yeah, I think that's a really important question, uh, Fibre. Uh, and I think maybe just to, 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 to pull it out a little bit broader, and I will speak about training, but I think, I think training is extremely important, but I think it's missing the point somewhat. This isn't, um, and it's important for me to highlight this, this isn't an individual social work issue, um, and it isn't a TUSLA issue either. This is a systemic issue that has uh, been allowed to develop through an absolute uh, absence of clear legislation and clear protocols in this area, and potentially an absence that has developed through, as we heard this morning, a societal kind of turning away, this kind of seen but not seen context of sexual abuse in Ireland. Um, so I'm going, I'm going way out broad, cultural, socially constructed sort of there. Um, so I, I'm hesitant uh, to, to point at individual agencies like TUSA albeit these are the experiences, and this is where adults are being channeled. This, as I said, not through, not through anybody's particular fault. This is the design we have at the moment. And I think social workers are struggling with this, as are other professions, um, in terms of how we, how we manage this. And what they're struggling with is not so much meeting the person, it's how we're encompassing this entire legal remit that has been placed upon uh, the system and placed upon the people coming forward. And uh, Marilene uh, highlighted this, uh, which is that great, great piece, which I'm going to go back to again, of law entering the room. Social workers are trained uh, to meet people from a trauma, from a, from a, from a trauma informed perspective, to meet people where they're at, to develop relationships, to work towards empowerment and collaboration. And, and that's what we train our students to do here. And that's what people go out to do in mental health social work, in community based social work, in child protection social work, in the day to day of child protection social work. Um, it's when we introduce this legal aspect and the adult becomes almost, dare I say it, you know, an obstacle for the practice of social work, that this is complicating issues, that we now have to engage with an alleged perpetrator or a person suspected of alleged abuse. We now have to weigh constitutional rights to good name, right to employment, right to privacy, with uh, a right under, under, the, under the United Nations Convention to be, to be protected from harm and, and re-traumatization. And we're doing all of that in the context of very little uh, support or guidance from an overarching political uh, structure. To bring that down in terms of the basic sense of training, I think the core ethos of, of trauma-informed care needs to be, it needs to be integrated uh, across the systems uh, for social workers, having an understanding of what sexual abuse is, how it can impact somebody, looking at somebody's history of abuse, but also their history of disclosure. Ramona might talk about this later, but we will meet people in our systems as professionals who have maybe had numerous attempts, numerous experiences of disclosure, sometimes not all positive. And those positive or negative experiences shape this current experience of disclosure. Disclosure is a fluid, it's an interrelational, it's a lifelong life course uh, phenomenon. 
So it's not this stop start. It's not this one off instance. So when you're meeting a person coming forward, you have to know that they have a history of abuse. Perhaps they also have a history of disclosure and understanding that and, and just listening to that person and, and taking time to hold that uh, is, is one of the core training pieces. So I don't know if there's a specific training that's required. Um, and I, I'm hesitant for social workers to bundle this onto their sh shoulders. Um, I think we need a wider system response to this. And, and I think the tools are out there, as I say, under the new victims directive as one pointer uh, to, to start integrating uh, those, those approaches into systems. I hope that answers it in my very stereotypical long-winded nature of answering questions. Uh, uh, fantastic, Joe. Thanks a million. And I think that uh, that it kind of also taught your response speaks to the kind of the quagmire that social workers are, are kind of the we we sometimes talk about the kind of the muddy the muddy lowlands that social workers walk through rather than the high lofty kind of kind of clear spaces that other maybe professions sometimes can can operate in. Um, just me, I know that you're probably conscious of time, but there's one other question there just in relation to, and maybe Ramona will be talking to this about any evidence internationally of the development of an adult bar a house for, for adult disclosures of abuse and, and how it's working in other jurisdictions and how we could lean on that uh, here in Ireland. Yeah, so we have, uh, so, so the, the Barna House system itself, um, you know, it, it's, it's quite well established in, in other countries, obviously coming from, uh, from an Icelandic model originally, but, but, but before that, even uh, based on the child advocacy centre models in the United States. So there's a robust evidence base around the, the functioning of it in terms of children. Um, we do have examples of it in Scandinavia as well, being used for adults in terms of domestic violence. Uh, so there are models there, and I've only recently become aware of the one in Canada, and I think it is actually in Toronto. So we might actually pose it to to Ramona at the end, and that's that is that is that model being used specifically for adults coming forward to disclose sexual abuse. So I think there are pointers here. Um, I don't necessarily see us needing to replicate the Barna House model for adults in Ireland as a specific centre, like a physical building, like it like it is proposed in other models. I think a model of wraparound services. So there is that provision when, as the EU Victims Directive says, when somebody comes and meets a competent authority, whatever they may be, that this suite of services is available to them, whether that be therapy, advocacy, um, uh, ter um, therapy, advocacy, social work support, or medical support even, that that suite of service comes, comes to meet the person. We have examples of it in social work practice in Tusla have a model called MEHL, uh, which operates at a community where something is deemed, uh, it, it's, it doesn't require a child protection statutory response, and it's best for the, 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 the family or the child to be met, their needs to be met at the lowest possible level. So it's put back to the community, and a community agency takes a, a key work role and coordinates the various services required around the child and the family. I think it's a beautiful model, and I think there's, there's scope maybe for that, uh, or to at least look at that in terms of adults coming forward to disclose sexual abuse. Thanks a million, Joe. How are we doing for time? Do you? Yeah, we're just coming up on time. So I'm, I might, um, uh, coming back into my facilitator role, uh, I might take the lunch break there and we're going to come back online at 10 past one. Uh, so a short lunch break, but I think people will appreciate uh, time to digest the, the, the volume of information and time to just get a break away. Uh, I'm going to put up the contacts for the various support agencies again. Uh, in the chat uh, when we resume and when we resume we're going to be joined by Hazel Catherine Larkin uh, and Mick Finnegan in the Voices from Experience uh, session so I'll briefly introduce that when we come back at 10 past one uh, and then we'll have Hazel and Catherine and we'll have uh, a live Q&A session then at the end of that session as well okay so I'm going to pause the recording here now and you're all very welcome to, to head off and get your soup and sambos or whatever the case may be thank you very much for staying with us uh, for the morning